his first class honors. Sorry. Simon received his uh, first class honors degree in geology from the University of Hull in 1989 and his PhD in geology from the University of Liverpool in 1993. He joined the University of West Indies in January 96 as a lecturer and was promoted to professor of sedimentary geology in 2006. He has broad research interests which lie in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic geology of Jamaica and the Caribbean region, as well as the development of geological resources. He studied mid-Cretaceous benthic and planktic forams as a part of his PhD research with a focus on Cretaceous and Cenozoic foraminifera of the Caribbean region. And he spent the last 10 years working to understand the, their stratigraphic distribution in the Americas. Today, he will present the basis for a large benthic foraminifera or LBF zonation of the Eocene of the Americas. Thank you, Simon. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay. Well, good morning or good afternoon or whatever the time is where you happen to be at the present point in time. Um, here it's a nice early 8 a.m. in the morning. So what I really wanted to do was to actually give you some of the background to how we've established a large appendix forearm zonation for the American Paleogene, um, which has largely been concentrated on successions in Jamaica but has also included other areas and looked at other parts of the Americas. So from Northern South America to Southern North America, um, where we've also got information that is pertinent. Now, this is one of the problems is that really we haven't had a large amount of work that's been done recently in looking at benthic forams and using them for any form of biostratigraphy. And part of this has largely been due to the fact that we actually find that there's very little independent correlation of the forams to other basically time scales. So for 10 years, I've been trying to work out the basically the Eocene stratigraphy of Jamaica. And to do that, we really required an independent um, dating of the successions, and really they are full of large romantic forearms. So we needed to build that up and we needed to calibrate it. So we calibrated them using the nanofossils. So we collected samples for large romantic forearms, samples if from the same levels or close to those levels for the calcareous nanofossils, so that we can actually correlate them together. Um, and that, for the first time, enables us to actually see the real high resolution changes that actually happen in these forearms, which is not what has been basically presented in the previous literature. Um, I should just introduce the team that's been working on that um, in alphabetical order. Mark, who has actually worked on the calcareous nanofossils, which is our independent um, calibration. So I, I send samples to him to work up for that. Eljan in Turkey, who came here about 10 years ago now and has cut up some of these forams and has been working with us on this. Ted Robinson, some of you will know, um, who's worked on the basically the Caribbean forams for the last 50 years and has been carefully involved in this. And my research student, Natalie Robinson, who's been working on the large Atlantic forams of Jamaica and particularly the platform interior forms, which I'm going to show you a few examples of at the end of this lecture. Now, the starting point um, for understanding the evolution of these, these forams, um, the, the, the forms that lead to Lepidocyclina, is Barker and Grimstale, 1936. And that model basically has been retained um, almost unaltered. Um, since it was published. So all the research afterwards has accepted this as the evolutionary scheme. And it basically shows two branches coming from Helico Stigina, um, which go one branch up through Eulepidina, through Polylepidina into Lepidocyclina, and another branch which goes into Helico Lepidina. 
So you just got this two branching pattern. Now, once we start actually looking at the distribution of these actual four amps, um, which is correlated against the, the nanofossils, we find that this is not the simple model that occurs. So this actually here shows the actual um, stratigraphy, um, the chronostratigraphy on the left, the nanofossil zonations, um, also the planktic four amps. ABZ represents the zones that we are basically setting up for the Americas. You've seen zones are running from number um, three through to number 16. And this actually shows here the distributions of the different groups of four amps that we're going to start talking about. Um, and immediately what you can see is that the scheme that has been proposed cannot work. Um, the Barker and Grimsdale scheme basically shows that Helicus digena dimorpha gives rise to many of these forms, but Helicus digena dimorpha actually occurs after most of these forms actually first appear. So what I want to do is briefly go through these and show you why we know they are different and, and how we set up these different clades. And so we have here five evolving lineages, which are split amongst four families because two of them situated in the Lepidocyclinidae um, basically show a very similar test structure and almost certainly have a common ancestor, whereas the others doubtfully have a common ancestor. Okay, so some of the bases. Well, what we've done is we've looked for free specimens. Um, the, the fact is free specimens, if we have free specimens, we can cut the orientations of specimens that are useful for us. So often we we're cutting equatorial um, or we took cutting axial sections. Um, this is better than using random sections where we are not going to be able to see the details of these forearms. Um, the nepionic acceleration is something that is very well known in orbitoidy form for aminifera, and I'm just showing a situation here. And, and what we see going from the top left across the screen and then across to the bottom right is we see the changes that go in one lineage. And so you start off with an embryo consisting of two chambers, then you have a short spire which terminates in a chamber R, which gives off two spires from that, which end in a closing chamber, which is shown on here as C. And as you go up sequence, the length of that spire decreases progressively. And so the number of R is given there. So R equals seven in the first one, progressively gets less until it actually gets down to two and it becomes symmetrical with four spires ending in two closing chambers. It goes on to become more complex after that, but I'm not going to worry about that, particularly in this case. But the thing is that what we do is we look for a number of specimens, hopefully five if we can get them, preferably 10, preferably more when we're building the data set as we go along, um, to actually look at means of these values and actually build up the information about populations and use statistics to compare them. And that is ongoing and will continue to go on. The other thing you can see nicely in here, these are all the same size, is the size of the embryo increases progressively as you go through that sequence as well. So you've got these progressive things that go on in the evolution of these particular lineages. Okay, so let me go back and just simply step through these lineages quickly. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so um, I, I want to basically uh, go through and work this out. So the first group is the Helicus Tegenini. Now we, we're setting up a new set of new families in here for the simple reason that that they are separately morpholo well, morphologically they're different and therefore we place them in different things. I'm not going to read that. Um, I'm going to make this preservation presentation available to you. So if you want to read that, you can do that afterwards or in the recording. I'm going to go through and actually show you what these sort of things are. So if we start with this, the most primitive form we place in this is, is Tremus Tegina. Now, you can see on the top right there, you can see this, this section here, this SEM that Ted actually did many years ago. And you can see the actual stolon patterns. 
And the stolon patterns are not just in the actual equatorial region, they actually extend down the ventral side of the test and the dorsal side does not have them. So what you've already got in here is a differentiation with actual stolons connecting the ventral chambers on the test. This still has relatively simple chambers in that situation. But as we go on, what happens is each of those stolons now connects to a chamberlet on the ventral side. And so you move into a series of specimens, if you look in the bottom left, where you can see a series of chamberlets. This is a, a specimen which has basically had the test dissolved away. And you can see a whole set of now chamberlets on the ventral side, which are by these stolons, yet on the dorsal side, they are not present. And you can sort of see that in the right hand side. And then just at the top, just to show you the complexity and problems with this group, if you cut this at different levels randomly, although these were cut systematically to show this, you can all get specimens not quite on the left, which actually show no actual subsidiary chamberlets on the ventral side, to one on the far right, which is cut through the chamberlets and actually just shows them. And so this is the next stage in the development. This gives rise to a whole series of different forms. Um, and the last forms are more advanced um, and actually form an orbitoidal growth pattern. And this is the, the last one we have in Jamaica, which had not been found anywhere else. And you can now see the, the, the single spire, which actually finishes. There must be an R chamber. It's very difficult to cut that. Um, for the simple reason, if you look in the axle section in number three, you'll see that these things are not flat, they're curved. Um, so cutting through them, it's very difficult to actually cut through a true equatorial layer, although you can get it with very symmetrical specimens. So there's a microspheric specimen and a megalospheric specimen. And then on the bottom right, you can see, you can't see the R chamber, but you can see the two rows of chambers that grow around the primary spire and then a, chosen, a closing chamber, which then gives rise to this orbitoidal growth pattern. So what we can do is we can then plot these up against the actual chronostratigraphy using the nanofossils. And, and here you can see this, this major radiation of these groups with lots of different forms actually going in there, the Helicosagina, Gyranus, and Dimorpha um, being the first two described. And they go up and they become extinct at some point in the late Lutetian without issue. There's, don't, they don't produce anything else, they just seem to disappear. Um, and they are useful to work with, but the problem with them is cutting equatorial sections because you can see most of these forms to some extent are asymmetrical and therefore you do not get cuts across them which actually show you the complete spires of the actual um, primary spire. Okay, so we can move on to the next group, um, the Helico Lepidinini, uh, which have generally been included with the Helicostagenidae um, in the past. But what we find is if, if we look at these, and I will miss the description, but you look at these, and this is one example of it, and you can see there are differences. For a start, the, the primary spire, if you look at the one in the top right, starts off and it continues to the edge of the test. Now, some of the other ones, it doesn't continue to the edge of the test. But what actually happens is additional chamberlets are developed from that primary spire, but the primary spire continues and wraps around them with the actual wall of that primary spire, sometimes preserved, in this case, well preserved in calcite. In some of other forms, it's not so well preserved. But then when you look at the axle section at the bottom right, you'll see that you do not get this well-developed ventral series of chamberlets. In fact, it's quite symmetrical in their lateral chamberlets on both sides. Um, so this evolves separately from the Helicus to Gina group as well. So this is quite a separate group. Um, cannot be related to the previous one because it really doesn't show any of the characteristics. We move on to the next one, and this is the Pseudolepidinini, which um, is represented by only a few specimens, doesn't actually show a long evolutionary history, not in, in the Americas as far as it's seen, but there are three different types that form. The most distinctive feature of these is that the equatorial layer 
close to the nucleus on the embryo is becomes double. And you can see that in the bottom right down. This is the most primitive one, which is not going to be in the paper. Um, but you can see there's a primary spire in the top right, and that gives rise to a chamber which gives off to two spires, which ends in a closing chamber. Um, this one was discovered after we got most of the way through the paper. Um, and there. But you also look at it in the bottom left, and you see it's got a very large number of lateral chambers. This is the one that's better known, the pseudolepidina. Um, and again, on the bottom right, you can see the double layer to the equatorial surface. This one is a bit different because it has an additional chamber on the top. You can see that in number four, there's a small little chamber on top, which might be part of the, the embryo, or it might be a, an additional chamber that grows afterwards, which is not on the equatorial plane. Um, and the final group that fits in here um, is, is a triplelepidocytina. And, and this shows the same pattern of the double equatorial layer, but in this case, it's got a, a central dividing solid layer of calcite between. Um, these tend to be relatively rare, although they do occur at one level relatively commonly, this group. Um, so you can see that um, zone A, B's. Z7 um, is where you get them, but they do occur at other levels and they certainly occur at higher levels, but they are not useful in zonation in this case, but I just throw them in here because we cut them up and we found them. Now we move on to the Lepidocyclinidae. Okay. Simon, and, Simon I'm yep. sorry to interrupt. We got, we got a comment in the chat. If you can point what you are showing us. Oh, okay, I will. Okay. You can right click and choose the laser um, laser option for your mouse. Okay. Can can people see the mouse arrow? Yes. Okay. All right. So we work with that. All right. So when we come to the Lepidocyclinidae, there's two separate evolution lineages. Okay. And they both, this one branches, they both show the same um, nepionic acceleration as, and, and so they are quite separate evolution lineages. Um, this is not we worked out before. Okay, and again, I'm not going to read through that. Um, so we separate these up into two subfamilies because they've got basically the same structure, but they are two major lineages. So the Lepidocyclinidae and the Orbitoinidae. So this is the first group. And uh, this is the group I showed initially to show the um, to show the evolution of the group, the epionic accelerant. So here you can see the progressive shortening of the spire as you go through. And then you get an increase in the numbers of chambers around the nucleus or the, the embryo. You get chambers which come off the actual initial two chambers. And eventually you start getting the second chamber folded around the first chamber. Okay, and these, if you plot these up, they show a progressive evolution as you go up through here. And if you take populations, the populations enable you to represent them in their sequence. And that fits in with the calibration to the nanofossils. So this forms a very strong basis for the zonation of the lutetian through to the pre -bonian. Okay, there are lots of different species, as you can see. I'm not going to show pictures of them, um, but the pictures of them are in the paper. So there'll be multiple illustrations of the different species in the paper. Um, the genera um, are largely based on what has been done historically. So Eulepidina has a long spire without lateral chambers. Eolepidina has a longer spire with lateral chambers. And then polylepidina has two principal accessory chambers here. And then lepidocyclina moves up into having a symmetrical spires. And finally, eulepidina, the second chamber starts wrapping around the first chamber. So this, this basically shows the evolution of this group. Um, we can plot some of these features up. So in here, we can see the 
actual size of the the embryo and, and it's we take it with the walls here it's simply what has been done before in the americas and you can see that the embryo progressively increases in size but there's a lot of overlap and there are sort of times when it increases quite rapidly and these couple of areas in here are actually um three three of them they're actually erosion levels in jamaica so maybe there's a gap or maybe the perturbations that go on because of sea level change um, basically facilitate an increase in the size of the embryo. And then we've got here the size of the number, the average number of R and the range of it. And you can see that progressively decreases until you get to two. So that is really what you can use, and particularly the R values in the first forms um, to actually zone your sections. Um, if we compare the, the length of the embryo to the width of the, the first chamber, um, which is measured on the interior side, because that's what we've done in the past, um, you can see that there's a progressive increase in both of those, but there's also quite a lot of overlap. So you need a rather large number of specimens to actually be able to use these characters to actually distinguish between species. We move on to the second evolutionary lineage. Um, and this lineage basically shows exactly the same pattern. But if you notice, the first one has a very short spire already, and it's occurring at the same time as the one with the spire of seven. OK, so this is already more advanced. OK, this all of these forms already have lateral chambers. So this is a quite separate lineage which developed and it developed much earlier and gives rise to what we look like typical lepidocyclinids, um, basically at the level down here where you've still got things that look like eulepidina and polylepidina in the other lineage. So you can see the same thing here. So, okay, a very short spire. Now the R is now the third chamber. Okay, R becomes the second chamber with two BACs developed, asymmetrical, and then you get into the forms that become, as, that become symmetrical in terms of two closing chambers and similar spires on either side. Okay, so that's one group of them. That's the second group, uh, which are a little bit larger in terms of their embryos. Um, and they actually get larger, some of the embryos, but we haven't found those yet in Jamaica. And then you get this strange one, Pliolepidina dobleri, um, which has a very short range, is only found in this single zone, which we define that zone on. Um, and it's very distinctive. If you find this, it's actually pretty distinctive um, and usually occurring in relatively large numbers of specimens. So, so you're reasonably happier at that particular level. And we've now correlated this in to the nano, nanofossils, and it clearly occurs in MP17. We can look at the same sort of evolutionary patterns, uh, and these are the changes in the, the basically the length of the embryo and the width of the first chamber. Um, and you can see that it's not quite as straightforward as in the Lepidocyclin ED. Um, and there's this very interesting form at the top, which actually shows a reversal of the trend, which we think is probably a separate lineage. And so we're actually seeing two lineages. This first lineage probably becomes extinct. And we get this, this lineage, which goes on and gives rise to things like Nephrolepidina uh, and probably some of the forms that have been included in Lepidosoclina. So what we're actually seeing is, is this form, um, a separate lineage, relatively easy to distinguish them because most of the time their embryos are smaller, um, but not all of them are quite like that. And this is going to be a little problematic up in Lecosine to sort some of these out. Uh, and this is plotting the two, again, the two sizes, the, the length of the embryo and the width of the first chamber. And you can see that if you ignore the small later one, you can see that these, these are actually quite distinct. Um, and if you get a population, they're actually going to plot, plot, 
plot in different places. And we've increased quite a lot the, the numbers of these since I actually drew this. So that sort of gives you the evolution of these, these particular groups. And, and these groups are particularly Lepidocyclinidae, these ones here, which actually show this, this very nice evolution. Why did distributed across the Americas and therefore very useful in terms of age distribution? If you don't have these, these are often pretty well distributed as well. These really don't occur much in Jamaica, but we've estimated the ages based on the assembly of the square. But you can see in here that the, the Helicus de Genidi evolved up here, disappear at this one point, you get an extinction event at this time. Um, it only appears to affect the yeasts, don't see much else. And then virtually all of the others, this might extend down, appear at the same time. So there's a big um, influx of new forms in that point, and these form these new evolving lineages. And there's a second extinction event, which we, we often well known at the top of the Eocene, where a lot of other forearms go as well. But these two groups go up through the Oligocene and into the Miocene. Okay, so that's one set of groups. Um, but in addition, we also get others which are useful. The Numilatidae are also very useful, but they do not have the same continuous ranges. What tends to happen is they appear for short periods of time and then they disappear. And so we get a series of short influxes of basically four of these groups, but a large number of small pneumolites come in at the same time where we see the appearances of the, the various groups that I've just been talking about. Okay, so here you've got it. So you've got down here, short-lived occurrence, here, short-lived occurrence, up here, short-lived occurrence, in here, a longer occurrence. Okay, so these forms, this one, this one, this one, this one, occur only through certain parts of the sequence. There is, appears to be no continuous evolution of these groups in the Americas. So this contrasts quite dramatically with the, with the other groups um, and obviously contrasts with the Tethian realm. We are just have a few pictures of these. Okay, so this is, we, we put this as a new genus simply because this was previously not found as free specimens. We have thousands of free specimens. And when you cut them up, you look at the first two chambers, the first chamber is large, more or less spherical. The second chamber is just a slit, slit-like on the side. Quite contrast with most of the other pneumolites or almost all other pneumolites. So it looks to be different and actually a separate evolutionary form. It's also the weird one in the Americas. It's the only one in the Americas where the two generations are remarkably different in size, whereas people will know that's the case in the tethys. But in the Americas, this is the only species which has a large microspheric form, which is, is multiple times the size of the meganospheric form. Um, this is the typical small pneumolites that occur, and these, these appear in, in flood abundance and continue up the sequence. Um, this is the other groups, the Perkinanoides and others. And, and so all of these appear and, and extend up the sequence. We haven't looked at them sequentially through the this, this succession yet, but we have large numbers of populations all the way through, again, the from the same samples. So they're calibrated against the the nanofossils, so we can in the future look and see if these provide us with more useful stratigraphy. Uh, and then, of course, Petrus Tegina comes in at two levels, but doesn't seem to show any evolution as far as we can see. Uh, I'm ignoring the Cuban earlier one, which also probably occurs in, in um, Trinidad. But they just appear to occur, and if you find them, you know you're either in the, the upper Eocene or within the upper Oligocene to Miocene. So this is how we built up the stratigraphy and this is how we built up the zonation. So each of the zones is either defined on the short-lived appearance of one of these pneumolite groups or by the evolution of the Lepidocyclinidae or in one case by the appearance of the, the Plyolepidine. Uh, and then we use the Helicostogenidae in the lower part of the sequence um, to, to add into the stratigraphy at that point. 
So that gives you the basis for the, the zone agent. But the trouble is we can only use the zone agent basically on the platform margin, although some of the forms are transported into somewhat deeper water, but pushing it back into the platform interiors becomes difficult because in general, you do not get the groups that we're using the zone agent going in that direction. So what we're now working on is to actually use the few occasions or many occasions, but not as many as you'd like, occurrences where we get the zonal forms occurring with the platform interior forms and use this to actually build a platform interior zonation or to use the platform interior forms to correlate back to the, the actual standard zonation. So using some of the conicals, so these are some of the typical conical agglutinated forms. Uh, this is the stratigraphy here, and this is just what some of them look like. And some of them are very long ranging, pretty much Eocene to Oligocene. And some of them have much shorter ranges, which can be used fairly to actually um, zone the platform interiors, or at least determine where you are. Um, so here, you, I'm just going to illustrate a few of the forms, just so you can see what they look like. Okay, so these are the Coliconus forms. Um, these only occur through a relatively short section of time and the two species occur at quite different levels in the stratigraphy. So when you find these, these are quite useful. The form of Coscinellina elongata might be a more primitive form in the lower Eocene from Florida. Um, Coscinellina again occurs as two forms. You can see the difference, the size is quite different as well. Um, the, neither has been described. We move up to Cushmania, which is, is well known to some people, and they fit into two forms. So there's Cushmania Americana, which actually has a slightly smaller form with a smaller um, first chamber, and then Cushmania Pontobelensis, which has a, a larger first chamber. And then you get up into forms, the um, Fabularia, uh, and these show a really rather nice evolution through the, the middle Eocene into the upper Eocene. Um, and in particular, this form of the top, at least across the Nicaraguan right in Jamaica, is very distinctive with these chamberlets developed inside the, the continuous chamberlets above a thicker band and you can see that developed from this so here got a thick basal layer and then the chamberlets on the margin and these are distinguished primarily on the size of the first chamber you then come up into a very again Nicaraguan type form which is Yabronella and as you can see from the illustrations here Yabronella really shows quite a significant variation in morphology from tightly coiled forms with very small first chamber to less tightly coiled forms with a slightly larger first chamber to forms which have much larger first chambers and are much less enrolled and enrolled in different ways and some of them become uniserial. Um, so you, you see that there's quite a significant difference here. Just the forms, they also ch so changes in the chamberlets all of these are later forms and the early forms show much simpler patterns to these chamberlets in these two species here um, but they seem to be continuous through so maybe subspecies might be the way to go um, and just showing a few patterns of these these have some of the more primitive um, forms so more tightly coiled with a relatively smaller first chamber these ones have a larger first chamber and become have a uniserial stage. These forms continually coiling around. Um, and you can see the problems of trying that equatorial sections when you look at when you look at an axial section of these things, um, because basically to cut through there and you see you lose parts of the actual the actual section because of cutting these because they're not flat. And then the first one, which was described is, is Jamaicansis. Um, which shows these patterns here, and you can see the very large initial chamber 
and the swollen test around that first chamber. So to, to wrap this up, um, so far what we've done is we've worked the Eocene out and we, we've got a very good um, stratigraphy that works where we've got either planktic forams or nanofossils from elsewhere in the American region. The, the actual zones fit perfectly into the stratigraphy. So these fit very nicely into what we see elsewhere. So the Jamaican stratigraphy calibrated against the nanofossils works where we find that elsewhere and information is available. Um, we are extending it into the Paleocene. At the moment, there's going to be only two zones, but possibly other groups will help advance that. It's just that the main evolution of these forms so far that we've looked at takes off in the actual Eocene. And the Oligocene to Mid-Miocene can be done, but the current calibration is debatable across different bits of the American province. Uh, we can then extend the zonation into the platform interiors using various other species. And that's sort of where we're going and, and Natalie is going to work on some of that. And the other groups, the other fragments and new militids, been various works on looking at some of the statistics, the new militids, offers hope that we might be able to use those to add additional information and resolution um, for parts of the stratigraphy, and possibly particularly the orthofragmines, maybe in the Paleocene, um, where they appear much earlier than many of the new militids and certainly a lot of the, the lepidocyclinid type groups. And so they offer a resolution in there. And, and so that's the sort of way we actually built this up and where we are looking at going in the future. Um, the full paper is currently being typeset, um, which describes the zonation for the Eocene. And that will be published in Carnet's Joel. Um, it's probably going to be about 150 to 200 pages with illustrations of all the forms that are used in the stratigraphy and our breakdown of the species. And of course, all of you know, Carnet's Geol is, is free access online. So everybody can get a free copy of that. Uh, and then this presentation, it's been recorded, but also I'm going to place it on, on my research gate and I'll put it on my personal website, sfmgeology.com. So I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope it sort of shows you how we now understand the, the, the phylogenetic development of some of these forms of forams in the American region. And of course, many of these forms, lipidocyclinids, evolved on, follow, following this and spread out through the Tertian region. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Simon. That was excellent. And I have learned more in the past half hour uh, than I've known about larger foramina for my entire career. So uh, not only on their stratigraphy, but morphology and taxonomy. So this, this was uh, excellent. Um, there's several questions. Um, yeah. If you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand. Um, oh, I guess those are applause hands, not raising hands. Um, so yeah, if you have a question, put it in the chat or uh, raise your hand under the reactions. Um, meantime, I have a question. I'm really fascinated by the agglutinated larger benthic forams. And um, I'm wondering, I, I presume there's modern larger agglutinated benthics. Um, has DNA sequencing been done on those? And if so, do they show a common ancestor with more primitive agglutinated forams? And then if so, why are they, do they harbor symbionts? Um, why do they have such complex chambers and sort of go in parallel evolution um, with uh, the other calcareous larger benthic foraminifera? One of the problems with most of these, these particular ones is that the lineages became extinct either in the Eocene or in the Oligocene. So we don't have the modern ones. Uh -huh. So there's a problem with that. Um, there may be analogs, but I don't know of the analogs.
But yeah, the very complex sets of chambers and the fact that they do appear mostly to be in the shallow water suggests they probably did harbor symbionts. Um, if you look at the large number of genera that have been described now, um, from the basically from the Cretaceous through basically to the Oligocene, um, they show the same development each time, which suggests there has to be a very strong you know, reason why they develop the same morphology. And obviously harboring symbionts is, is the likely, is a highly likely um, scenario, yeah. Great, thanks. There's a comment from Lisette. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm so glad to see updated Biostrad and taxonomy of these groups. Um, Brent has a question. Brent, you wanna go ahead and ask it? Brent Wilson, can you hear me? Um, sorry, we can't hear you. You don't seem to be muted. Let's try that. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah, great. Lovely. Thank you. Hello, Simon. Lovely Hi, Brent. to see you. Hi. Um, I have a question. I'm afraid it steps outside of your taxonomy somewhat, but it's something that's puzzled me for a long time. Um, in 1975, Max Dobson and Joe Haynes recorded what they called Asterocyclina cf stellata on the Irish continental margin. Later, Joe Haynes, this was part of my master's degree, decided that it was in fact Asterocyclina soldadoensis. Mm -hmm. Two things I would like to ask. First of all, do you, uh, would you be able to speculate how it got from Soldado Rock to Porcupine Bank. And secondly, do you know of any other instances of species from the Americas being found in Northwest Europe? Okay, well, there, what we do know certainly is that many of these large appendage forearms, some of them, well, a good number of groups did evolve in the Americas and they migrated out at some point. So the Lepidocyclinids themselves do start turning up in Africa. And then presumably from Africa, they then basically populated the Oligocene to Miocene around the Tethys and off into the Pacific, um, as well as remaining in the Americas where they may have gone extinct earlier. And, and there's some question about the stepwise extinction of these, these different groups. Um, it would be interesting to look at some of the African forms and see if you can place them within the evolutionary lineages of the Americas that we now can, can pretty well tie down. Um, but single specimens aren't gonna work. You need relatively large numbers. But that implies there are ways of hopping across. So whether that is you know, attached to some form of um, phytal material, which actually floats across, or whether it's it's hopping from one particular shallow water area to some form of um, shallow water island, some Bermuda type thing, and hopping across. And if you can get there, if, if the embryos can get there while they're still valid, you can put a population and then they can move again. And these sorts of things have been seen. So it seems to be a hopping situation. Why some did and why some didn't may simply be on the longevity of that embryo, because we assume that the embryo was, was planktic. Um, so that if, you, if they got far enough, you could have that situation happening. Um, and of course, you know, tropical storms drive things rather quickly. So it's entirely possible that a very random occurrence could set up a population in one place, which may not, um, may not survive for very long, but if it produces enough specimens, we might be able to find it in terms of its, its um, preservation in the geological record. Lovely, thank you. That's, that's been puzzling me for years and years. Yeah, that's just what, I mean, that's, that's why I would suggest it, but they, they clearly did migrate. Yeah. Um, the interesting one is, directions of migration this is always one of the things in that directions of migration always don't seem to 100 percent work with with where things appear and that's that's one of the questions that 
you know, as we get a better understanding of how the different groups and different parts actually relate to each other, maybe we can actually find those sorts of things. Lovely. Thank okay, you. we've got a couple more questions. Um, Malcolm, do you want to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Simon, nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Malcolm. Well, not quite um, seeing you, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put my camera on so you can. <laughs> um, I'm I'm top of my head. Hi there. Um, I, I was looking at your two little extinction events that you numbered one and two up the column, and yeah. I was trying to get my head around where they are in normal stratigraphic terminology rather than right. your AB zonation. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. But one of the troubles with pre, you know producing these sort of paper, you know, images for, for PowerPoint is they get very small and you can't actually see the kind of stratigraphy very easily. The mm -hmm. the first one, the first one, which just affects that single group, the Helicostigenidae, appears to be close to the top of the Lutetian. Um, that is that one is there. I don't see anything else happening with that. The second one which I actually didn't put on there, which actually affects the platform interior and, and some of the other groups is actually at the top of the Bartonian. And that one is relatively, I think, well known that there's a turnover at that time. And the third one, which was numbered number two, um, but it didn't, it was, there were only two on that diagram. The third one is right at the top of the Preobonian or slightly above, depending on where the forearms actually really do go extinct. Um, and I think one of the problems is there's also reworking of some of these large benthic forearms into deep water, which makes it difficult to pick up extinction events in deeper water, but in shallow water, they all seem to go at the same time. Yeah, so we, in, on the European side, of course, at that Lutetian Bartonian boundary, we're seeing quite a few changes in the benthic foraminifera, larger mm -hmm. benthic foraminifera. Yeah. So that would figure. So mm -hmm. probably at the end of the sort of mid Lutetian thermal event or whatever its acronym is these days. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I've sort of I've sort of played and looked at it, but it's it's not that easy to correlate things directly in. Um, one of the things to do in the future would be to actually look at one of these sequences, one of these sections here, where we actually do have. Um, a record across it and actually look at some of the geochemical indicators to, to see if we can pick up something related to this. Great, thanks. Uh, German, do you want to ask your question? Or I could ask for him, um, are there plans also testing the biozones with the strontium isotope record uh, of the used localities? Okay, some of the, I didn't include any of that, but some of the strontium isotopes have been done for some of these areas. The real problem is finding well preserved enough material to actually basically get the ratios out of. Um, some of it works, some of it doesn't appear to work, and that simply is because I think it's altered. Um, we don't easily get a large amount of. Um, thick shelled calcitic fossils in many of these locations. So it makes life difficult to actually do that. Um, Bridget, do you have a question? You want to ask it? Uh, hi, Simon. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was uh, thinking about, you know, like the papers by like Pamela Halleck in the early 90s, looking at kind of the bigger picture of the evolution in the larger benthics and, and whether there's any relationship with sort of like the sea level curves of Camilla, for example, and whether mm. you can sort of pull apart some of the mechanisms for the turnovers. It's interesting in some ways in the, the, the actual, some of these, some of these real changes, particularly where, the, where there's a, a big jump in the size of the embryos, does correlate to sea level changes. Now, is that a gap? 
or is it because there's a evolutionary response because sea level is changing? Um, I don't think there's gigantic gaps in some of these sequences. We don't seem to, in general, see any big gaps. Um, and of course, all of that is plotted. You know, you can plot these things up against, you know, a time scale, you know, correlated against the nanofossils, and you do see to see these, these these times when there are significant jumps, and they do seem to correlate to the the unconformities or the disconformities, which we can map out in the sequences or the successions. So I get the feeling that at times, yes, they're, they are evolving more quickly because there's a perturbation in the environments. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Cesare, do you want to ask your question? Thank you. I would like to know if you uh, recognize the some characteristic assemblages uh, of large abantic forms for each of our biozone, because uh, we can compare them with the corresponding biozones in the shallow bantic donation. And this is, should be very interesting for us. The, the real, real difficulty is that a lot of the, um, a, lot of, a lot of the American forms at this time are, are basically completely different. From the tethering forms so it makes it very difficult yes, to compare the two um so so what the mo at the moment what we're doing is we're trying to well obviously one you need to be able to correlate everything into something that is chronostratigraphic that's the first thing because until you do that you can't do anything but but what we seem to see is that the, the at, at this level in the instant there's, there's not a great deal of similarity going on um you, you look at the upper Eocene, for instance, where you get nice evolutionary stories of the um, heterostegina. Um, it it doesn't fit. It, you don't see that in the Americas. It just seems to be one species. So, so we, we're building up, but even the smaller benthics, you know, don't seem to help us as much as we like. So, I'm not sure at that level it's going to be easy. I think it might be easier once you get up into the Oligocene and Miocene and might see more similarity. Okay, so you recognize your, your biozones uh, according to one uh, or uh, two index species? At the moment, yes. Okay, thank you. I mean, at the moment we're building it, we want to add in the, the smaller numulites and things like that. But at the moment it becomes very difficult to, well, there's not the work being done on that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I have one more question, if, since I don't see any right now. Um, I'm wondering about the micro CT scanner and whether or not you see understanding of the evolutionary lineages and evolution of the major groups uh, to advance through the th more 3D renderings of these larger benthic foraminifera. I expect it's difficult to find specimens that are not infilled um, but still, it seems like that could also be helpful for future research. I think it certainly would be. I don't think there's any doubts about it. Um, if we could come across levels where we had um, specimens which were free of calcite infills, that certainly would be something worth going on. Uh, they do occur. Um, we have seen them. You know, we, There are occasional levels. Um, if we could get enough of them, yeah, that would be something. But it probably is going to be probably going to take a lot more samples than finding one here that has specimens that are suitable and one here that has specimens uh, and then to actually look at it and I think that would become very very important as um, to, to firm this up and to understand it better. Cool. Well um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so uh, thank everybody for attending and, and Simon thank you so much for that excellent lecture. Uh, just a reminder, July 29th, we've got a lecture coming up from Bruna Diaz, um, and we look forward to everybody joining us then. Thanks very much, everybody.